should be in the session preserving your farm. This is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, the Francins are here. They're going to be basically. I'm going to turn it over to them and let them uh, do their spiel. They're going to talk for a while, um, and then they're going to have quite a bit of time for questions. So you might want to hang on to your questions until they open it up. Let them do their talk, and then uh, we'll open it up to the floor. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you, Tim. Um, you guys can come up here too. Okay, I guess we're going to start out our little 15 minute first and then turn it over to Jim. Um, there are flyers in the back for you, and um, I guess we'll start out with introducing who we are. Tom and Irene up here with our three children, Jess in the center in the back, Jolene, and James up front. Um, we've been farming, well actually Tom started farming before we were married. This is a family farm from his parents, and farming a number of years on 385 tillable acres and very diversified. This is an aerial shot of our farm to get a little perspective of um, what we have on our farm. Um, as I said, uh, we're very diversified and a number of you have probably heard Tom speak at various presentations, not only at PFI but others. But I think the one thing that I probably have heard the most often is diversity leads to stability, and I guess this is what, what we've really been trying to practice on our farm. Um, with that, in 1992, doing a number of research projects and sustainable methods of farming, we were fortunate enough to be able to participate in a holistic resource management course which really turned the keys on what we were doing and how we were doing it. Um, prior to that, we were probably kind of doing lots of things, but just kind of fumbling and not knowing for sure which direction we were going. In keeping in mind with the holistic course that we participated in, the very first thing that we did when we came back home was to sit down with the kids. And at that time, they were younger. and wanted to share what we had learned from our course and found that the very first thing that we needed to do was some establishing some goals on our farm. The first thing we did was we set a farm motto in place, which you see right here, which is also on your flyer handout. We believe that we shall see the bounty of the Lord, uh, bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. With that in mind, we took it to a next step and created a three-part goal, quality of life, forms of production, and future landscape description. And I'm not gonna go through all of those listed that you have on your flyers. You can you know, certainly go through that on your own. And based off of that, we've tried to continue that practice of those uh, certain certainties in mind of how we want it to live our life on the farm and what we were going to do through forms of production and how we wanted to protect the land and be good stewards. Through that, in time, we see that we needed to continue and we added a few of the extras at the bottom of our quality of life because of where our age is at now, including the um, planning of transitioning, which is what we're here for today. Where did we go next? Um, about a year ago, we really finally sat down and did some serious talking together instead of just thinking about it in our minds as to what we needed to do next so that we could create that transition considering our age. And we wanted to start talking about it now instead of maybe 10, 15 years from now. And James had been working outside of the farm and decided that it was time to come back because that was his long-term desire was to continue farming. From there, we had contacted a farm financial consultant. And on the next page, you'll see where some of the early things that we've been starting to do so far has been on establishing our objectives. We sat down with him and tried to determine, somewhat in a similar fashion of what we did with holistic resource management, with writing our quality of life goals, or our three-part goals. So we tried to establish the same thing with our objectives. We started writing down what we needed to look at and what we need to be doing 
to have, hopefully, a successful, comfortable transition to the next generation. Um, from there, with the objectives, we also listed our concerns, as you can see on the paper. Um, I think Tom and James will probably get into more of the detail on that. And from there, some of the actions that we needed to take to take care of those concerns. And I'm going to turn it over to you guys now so that you can go from there. We're trying to stay on a limited time so that we have lots of input from all of you. So, okay. each of us. And just to kind of summarize what Irene said, that prior to taking a course in holistic management, um, we had uh, a lot of activities, but not necessarily a direction for the farm. Uh, after we took the course, then we stated what was important to us in our lives. And that's really important because, and the reason we're bringing this up now is that it was very important at the time we took the course. It's very important for all those years, the different things that happened on the farm, because we couldn't make actions, we couldn't make decisions, good valid decisions, without an idea where the decisions were going to take us. Well, it gets really relevant today when uh, I'll turn 60 in March and we start the discussion of generational transfer. So once again, if we don't have an idea where we're headed, we have no idea of how to test the proposed actions if they're going to move us where we really want to go. So it's very important for us to go over uh, our, what we really want out of life and who's involved with the, this decision-making process and to reinforce the fact that this is what we really want. Uh, that model uh, that uh, we've, the farm has to, really two things, when it says diversity leads to stability, that's extraordinarily important and you hear us say this quite a few times because we're real convinced that as we go through a generational transfer, the farm has got to be stable. And that stability is going to have to come from a diversified approach to moving the farm forward. So we can't have all of our bags and all of our eggs in one basket. We need an approach that provides for long-term stability over here in a uh, what really is a risky time is a transfer from generation to generation. Um, I do want to uh, add a little bit to this that by our model, which is really important part of the farm, is that we think we'll see a prosperous life uh, based on a belief in God in the land of biological diversity. That's how we read that. And so as we move the farm forward, it is important that we try to maintain in some fashion our values, even though we'll lose control of that over time as we get older. So it's, it's, it's an interesting time, but our holistic management principles are probably more important than they ever were because how are we going to try to preserve something if we don't really know how important it is to us, and how are we going to make the dozens of decisions that have to get made if we don't have uh, that anchor in place that says, well, we are not necessarily an anchor, but that measurement stick in place that this is moving us where we really want to go. So that's, uh, that's largely where we are right now, and, and uh, James, give his perspective. Well, uh, as you heard, my desire is to uh, you know, keep the family farm in operation, for the next generation and hopefully generations after that. Um, we don't know where we're going to be within five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. We don't know what, what exactly the picture is going to have for each detail. But we do have an idea of what our goals are going to uh, be in order to form the surrounding of that picture. And of course, my picture is that the farm is still in operation. Uh, the buildings are still up and keep and livestock is still uh, the main part of the farm uh, production, livestock and crops. As I move forward to uh, continue the farm in operation, uh, some of the conflicts I have with getting that farm from one generation to the next would be uh, the major risk, which is financial. How would I uh, go out and uh, buy all the equipment out or buy all the livestock out or buy all the land out, and meanwhile, you keep the debt low enough where I can still uh, survive for the, to fight the next day. And uh, um, especially when we talk about high land prices, uh, one of uh, my goals would be, what if, well not really my goals, but one of the future risks would be, with the farm at only so many acres, would the farm require more acres down the road in order to stay surviving? And we have some uh, possible future opportunities within so many uh, years to increase the farm with more land or to uh, secure more land that we are currently renting. So the main focus would be to spend money on 
securing more land or securing the right equipment or facilities or maybe the right production uh, uh, enterprise, but we have to you know, search for and seek for that instead of the principal, the main operation. So if we can secure our financial for future uh, additions to the farm or improvements, that I see as a uh, far better goal than just trying to manage our debt to keep the farm going itself. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about some specific things we did in the past uh, year's time to, to begin the generational transfer. So since it's a diversified farm with throw to finish hogs and with also a beef cow herd that we finish out uh, to slaughter, plus we also have a farm business, so it's a, it's a fairly complicated, an off-farm business, so it's a fairly complicated mix. But he has got, uh, he does custom farrowing for us, and he also has uh, an operation on a, an, an acreage that he rents where he uh, buys feeder pigs and feed, feeds them out. So that's giving him a beginning of uh, farming activities. Um, for the first year, the farm sold him uh, grains at a, a very favorable price to him for those enterprises. Um, but that still is a, is a, uh, what we want to call it economic uh, challenge for them because it's just that's just the way it is in the livestock business. So uh, that was right for the beginning year. For this next year, now what we're going to do is he won't be buying any grains from our farm. I'm just going to trade him. He's going to have some crop acres this year that he'll rent from us. He'll grow some uh, a, a corn crop on those acres, and then he's going to pay me, give me back the corn that he's going to use up this year. So I'm going to have, I'm trading him 2012 for corn for 2011 corn, which eliminates expense for him, eliminates an income for me in this following year, and that, that balances out. Um, then the next thing is that we're going to transfer the sow herd in a similar practice to what it did when my father and I uh, had the same discussion in 1973. What I did was, is my dad had a farrow to finish operation, so he didn't sell his sow herd off and I went and bought another sow herd. I rented his sow herd for a year and then I saved my replacement gills out of my first batch of pigs and then a year later he sold off his own sow herd and by then I had my own sow herd and so that allowed us to begin a generational transfer in the 1970s uh, with livestock. Um, so we're, we're starting with the hogs then we're going to start as he will rent acres from us to get his own feed supply but then we also have a beef cow herd and so we haven't had that discussion yet but I see the same thing going on with beef cow herd. He can probably uh, rent our cow herd for a year then save back his own heifers and start his own beef cow herd but there's a lot of money involved because cattle now became very expensive and they were very cheap uh, 15 or 20 years ago relatively speaking. Uh, actually all of this the amount of money involved is, is far higher than we ever dreamt it would be. Um, we had uh, uh, just yeah. the the complicated part about livestock and crops would be uh, hogs are connected to the corn on the farm. So if I get into the hog production, I need the corn production. But with the beef cattle, they're connected to the hay and the pasture, which is uh, far more acres and far, far more higher value, higher portion of the farm. Yeah, that gets complicated. <clears throat> to actually start this process off, uh, when we uh, uh, consulted with uh, uh, the, the first person we worked with, um, uh, we have, Irene and I started an off-farm business about 10 or 15 years ago uh, that we uh, buy and sell and process organic uh, proteins. And, uh, it's an, and it's an important part of our life, but nonetheless it takes about so much time as well. But nonetheless, the business she and I own, and we have two older, uh, uh, older daughters. So what we did is, uh, a year ago, we burdened the business with a whole life insurance policy on her. And the beneficiaries of that of life insurance policy on her are our two oldest daughters, they each get half. And if uh, she dies, then he inherits half of that business. If I die, he inherits the other half of the business, or however that works out first. So we took a non-farm uh, uh, asset, and we developed a plan that transfers it without that asset being tore up. We're not going to, that business doesn't have to get sold off in order for him to buy it back or anything like that. We burden the business with life insurance to ensure that wherever we can, that it'll go forward. So that's kind of where we are right now. And this way it's a little more fair too, considering the three children and, and with having the group discussion with our daughters too, they felt that that was comfortable with them because of 
um, they have chosen other careers, but they too have the desire of wanting to keep the farm in the family name. So that was, you know, one of the main reasons why we wanted to do something to set up so that they too can have a piece of the pie, <laughs> whatever, but, you know, so that it was fair. Yeah, I think we probably shot our time. Yeah, I think we need to move on to Jim so that he can do whatever he wanted to cover and... I know Jim will do a lot better than what we just did as far as the detail is, uh, uh, on options of what's out there. So, okay. I will give them a hand. I bet they did a great job. With high prices for farmland and other business assets, it is hard to end up with an estate plan where you treat everybody absolutely equal but at the end of the day, I think everybody agrees that you ended up, you end up with a plan that everybody f perceives as it's fair. And I think uh, I'd certainly tip my hat to Tom, Irene, and James. They talked about some solutions that they came up with, which I think is going a long ways towards that goal. Another thing I would offer there is that there's no cookie cutter approach to this process. You just have to customize it for each individual situation. Everybody has a unique situation, different numbers of children, different size of operation, and so you really just have to drill down for each particular situation and try to uh, come up with some good solutions. And I think, uh, as Tom and Irene talked about, they've kind of done it in stages. They started out with their uh, protein business, and then they're moving into the grain, and then the hog operation, the cattle operation, then eventually actually the, the uh, farmland. So that's, I think, makes a lot of sense. You, um, as they often say, when you start this process, the most important step is the first step. That is to get started, so you bet. So discuss ways to preserve your assets, build family harmony, and you know, that's, there's no easy way to do that. There's gonna be contradictions and possibly conflict. But the goal is to keep the farm alive, which is, or keep the dream alive, which is to keep the farm and the uh, family for the next generation. There's my contact information. I meant to didn't jump over that. If anybody has additional questions, I've got email, f uh, phone number, et cetera, so feel free to uh, contact me if you'd like additional information. So uh, we developed a lot of resources. Uh, we're dedicated to help uh, people in your situation. Uh, there's obstacles, we'll cover those briefly, and then where do you go from here? Most people we work with, and I would guess that most people in the, in the room today would agree that you want to keep your farm business and the family for the next generation. It is your number one goal. And why it becomes so important is that just what we've experienced the last three or four years where if you had sold the farm maybe eight or 10 years ago, how much regret you would have that you didn't make that effort to keep it in the family because you just all of a sudden saw this big bounce in value and you would have lost that opportunity. And as we go forward, it's hard to predict where we're gonna go from here, but just keeping the business assets together and intact is, is important. Most people want what's best for their children and to maintain the family harmony so that they're fair to everybody. And I think this, issue of fairness and being equal is worth spending a little more time on. As I said earlier, being absolutely equal makes it almost impossible to transfer the business to the next generation. Well, how do we tackle that? Well, when you develop your estate plan documents, your will, your trust, the, the trust is really an extension of your will. It gives you a lot more control over short-term and long-term goals. I, most people I work with I generally recommend uh, revocable trusts, which allow you to be flexible, adapt them to future changes as you go forward. But then when the uh, parents die, those trusts do become irrevocable so that they do get locked in at that point. But they are revocable up until either the death or incapacity of the parents. Uh, and also I think the will and trust is the best place where you can make your wishes known. And it's okay to reflect your state of mind in your own words. I know that you look at wills and trusts and you think that they have to be formalized documents, but you can kind of 
use it as an opportunity to write your story, explain why you did the things you did. There's nothing to, that prevents you from doing that, and I think a lot of people miss that opportunity. So you kind of spell out what you did and why you did it. So I think that will or trust creates that opportunity to do that. In terms of uh, trying to be creating this sense of fairness, uh, and I think uh, uh, the Franzens did a great job, is that they're trying to recognize the contribution of time, energy, and they call it sweat equity, of the operating son, in this case, uh, their son James. So one solution, you can create an option to buy for that next generation operating heir where you give them a discount on the purchase price to recognize that contribution. And um, then you can set a low interest rate. Uh, we've got very favorable, favorable rates uh, in today's marketplace. And uh, you have to factor in, of course, how many children, what you've done for the other children. Maybe you've helped them get started in another business or helped with education. So only the parents understand that background so that they're in a position to know what's the right thing to do. And as one of the experts described it, the parents can do things for the child, in this case James, that he can't do for himself. That is, if mom and dad die and they haven't done any planning, then his only hope is to try to negotiate some kind of deal with the other kids. Well, they're gonna be advised by their legal counsel, the in-laws, the outlaws, as they say, to say, hey, you're entitled to a full one-third share of the fair market value of this estate. And if the parents haven't done any planning, that's the way it is. And that's when we often see the only result becomes that the farm operation must be sold, and then that, of course, is not the goal that we started out with. So it is important to realize that parents can do things for the son or daughter who's operating the operation that they can't do uh, for themselves. A couple other options, you could give the base operation to the farming son and then put the other farmland into a trust where he has the right to rent it so that you've kept it again intact and then you can set the terms over short term uh, and long term and then maybe eventually give them the option to buy it at some point. So it just buys time and creates more flexibility. So that's a long discussion, this fair versus equal, but I think it is really important to, this is really becomes kind of the heart and soul of a good um, estate and business succession plan. Uh, there's, in your outline, there's a story of a typical farm operation called the Wilsons, and they kind of reflect somewhat the situation that the Franzens are in. They had one child that wants to be, continue the operation, but when uh, they ever talked about the future, uh, Tom would say, hey, Dad, what's the deal? And, and uh, Dad says, hey, someday, son, this will all be yours, and then we can see what happens. Uncle Sam elbows him in the head and said, gee, thanks, and he grabs a bunch of tacks, and then the other kids are saying, what about me, Dad? And so I think it kind of captures some of the conflict that we see for uh, this business continuation. So I'm going to run through this quickly, but after Dad died, he didn't do the planning right. He left a joint tenancy. And uh, that meant all the assets are now owned by mom. She, Tom didn't worry at this point. He was sure mom would honor dad's wish. But then when mom died, her will just left an equal share to all the kids. So tragic end of the story. Because of the big bounce in the values, the operation had to be sold. Tom was disappointed. He had many years of the contribution were not recognized. And uh, he told the story with sadness. I hope my story will help other families avoid the same fate. So what happened? The parents didn't follow through. Uh, Tom and Deb were lost on many fronts. And the siblings, that they decide, well, if I want to sell my interest to Tom, I'm entitled to a full fair market value. If I give him a big discount, that means I take a big haircut in my inheritance, and that's usually unrealistic. And I think you can also, we, they've, they talked about the community aspect of this. The, com the local community loses because you lose not only the impact of the family members, but also the ongoing operation of the business. So the obstacles to planning, taxes, uh, preserving, making sure that the parents have a secure income, 
and then doing the transfer of the business and working with your other advisors. Now, uh, the place to start to figure out your tax bill is you just need to update your balance sheet. Take it to your attorney. We can do tax analysis to figure out, okay, if you plan it this way, this will be your tax bill. If you plan it this way, you have the opportunity to save a lot of taxes. So how your assets will be distributed, as we said, depend upon your will, trust, property ownership, and beneficiary designation. So when you update your plan, most people think, aha, update my will, I'll be home free. Well, that's part of it, but you also need to coordinate and synchronize the ownership of your assets and the beneficiary designations of your insurance and retirement accounts. Uh, they were talking about leaving a legacy during lunch as an example. They talked about making uh, practical farmers a beneficiary of insurance policy. Really a better idea is to use your IRA because otherwise IRAs get taxed, whereas life insurance is tax free. So that's just an idea that you might want to uh, consider as you make those legacy gifts. Now. This uh, diagram is a little complicated, but it just tries to capture the essence that you've got many different types of assets. They're going to be distributed in different methods. The key message here, don't leave any stones unturned. You've got to make sure you've carefully examined each type of assets and understand how each will be distributed. So your goal, if you coordinate your documents, asset ownership, and retirement accounts, you can make sure they'll go to whom you want, when you want and how you want. And that's really a key as aspect of good estate planning is that you can do whatever you want. It's your estate plan, it's your assets, you can distribute it the way you want. There's no law or rule that says you can't favor one child over the other. It's just a matter of what you think is the right thing to do and being fair. Now, you may be aware that we've had dramatic changes in the estate tax law. Uh, late in December 2010, they actually increased the estate tax exemption up to uh, $5 million for each uh, taxpayer or individual. So if you're a married couple, that means husband gets $5 million, wife gets $5 million. Now we have a $10 million exemption, which covers most people. It's like 99.8% technically. So most people, they've taken estate tax concerns off the table. The good That's the good news. But pay attention, on January 1, 2013, Unless they change the law, it reverts to a million dollars. Now, I just have to put that up there because that's the facts. That's the way it, it works. Most people feel like that Congress will come to their senses and pass a bill that keeps the exemption at a higher level for a longer period of time. But unless it happens, you know, we if that if it goes back to a million bucks, then we're all going to have to go back to the drawing board and. Uh, yeah, that's still one million per person, so then it takes it up to two million for a married couple. Good point, but uh, it's still not very. It's you know, with the high high land values that we see today, what is that? Uh, maybe a couple hundred acres or something like that. So it's not very much. Okay, um, so it is only a temporary fix. There's a chart that kind of summarizes it, and the next couple charts is just briefly describing. With plan A, without proper planning, you end up with a $500,000 tax bill. It's kind of a throwaway item, maybe five, 600 bucks. Not that, you know, I'm saying that that's not, you know, peanuts, but that's, you know, it's fairly modest. But now, because, you know, they, they're, they've, they've recognized that as a resource to increase their revenue, they've really jumped up the probate cost. Plus, a lot of times, attorneys will, if, if they, uh, uh, under the Iowa code, they're entitled to get a 2% fee on a probate estate. Well, back in the old, ironically, I should say, that when they passed that bill, the reason they did it was to put a cap on legal fees because 2% of a $100,000 estate was 2,000 bucks. Everybody thought that was fairly reasonable. I mean, you know, there's work to do. You gotta, you gotta file all the forms, you gotta do the tax returns, prepare all the distribution documents, the deeds, and so on. So I mean, there's work to do. So, you know, 2,000 bucks is fair, but now you take 2% of a $5 million state, you know, now you're up to 100,000 bucks, and then all of a sudden, whoa, this 2% that initially was a cap has now become a gigantic burden for uh, family, farm, and business owners. So the other advantage of the trust over will is that with the trust, you can negotiate the fee 
ahead of time so that you don't have to look at that 2% fee. So those are two or three advantages. Another advantage is that the trust is confidential. If you plan your state with a will, when you go through probate, all of our courts, as you may know, are transparent. They're open to public inspection. So, you know, if you're, uh, I guess, nosy enough is maybe a word, you can go down to the probate court and check out probate files of anybody that's died in your county the last five, 10 years, if you want to, you know, I mean, they're public records, so you, anyone can have access to it. Whereas with a trust, it's all confidential. There's no disclosure of what you have. So those are some real advantages of the revocable trust, and that's why they've really, you know, become very much, that's why they've become very popular. Now, having said all that, the one fly in the ointment is that you gotta remember, with a will and the probate court, the probate court will make, I'm gonna use a salty word here, but make damn sure that your, that your estate's assets are distributed the way according to your will. With the trust, you have to rely on the, the uh, loyalty and, and the uh, ability of the trustee to follow your wishes. So there's not as much oversight, so that's, that's a, a drawback. I've seen that bite people before, so. Okay, that's yes, question. question back here. Yeah, plus I'll, I'll repeat the questions. Yeah, is there an estate tax for that the state of Iowa charges? Okay, good question, and I didn't mean to jump over that, but the question was, is there an inheritance tax, which technically there's a federal estate tax, and then you have a state inheritance tax. That's the way the system has, has uh, historically worked. In Iowa, about 15 years ago, they actually passed a bill so that there is no inheritance tax if the properties pass to lineal descendants. Now, lineal descendants include your spouse, your kids, grandkids, etc. So basically, as long as you distribute the assets directly down the line of your family, in Iowa, right now, there's no inheritance tax. So that's good news. Now, if you give property to in-laws or nieces and nephews, then you're looking at about 8 to 10% Iowa inheritance tax. Okay? So... That, that, that's really, in, in Iowa, that's kind of been a, uh, a good deal for, for our citizens, certainly. Okay? Yes, question? I have a friend who, uh, his family left, uh, had qu quite a bit of farmland, and they put it all into a trust. And he says the trustee is uh, basically milking the trust for all they can get out of it, and the family's not... Uh, have any control over the trust. My friend took it to the court to try to break the trust, but was unsuccessful. And he says basically his hands are tied and he would like to have, since his family put all the hard work into building this farming operation, that the actual heirs should have control over it. And he wants to break the trust. Is there any remedy for him? And if there isn't, why shouldn't there be some? Right, okay, the question was, uh, so a friend or someone you knew set up a trust, appointed the trustee. The trustee has been milking the trust and really t probably taking high fees and not managing it as well as it could be. And that really raises the issue. If you do set up your estate plan with a trust, you need to be very, very careful about the selection of the trustee. Now, if you name a local bank as an example, that may be what happened in this case. You know, was it an institutional trustee or was it a family member or? It was an institution, so it was a, probably a, a bank. And so, yeah, obviously, uh, it, it is very difficult to, to break trust. Uh, what, what you run into is that you can modify a trust, but you need the consent of the grantor. Well, it's presumably the grantor has died. You need the consent of the trustee, and you need the consent of all the beneficiaries. And sometimes that gets dicey because you go, you know, down the generations. And so the the block, the the obstacle you have, or in that case, is that the trustee's not willing to to cooperate. And so a way to solve that problem is that you can create. A, um, a, a trustee advisor so that the trustee advisor can change the trustee if they don't, and the trustee advisors typically are the beneficiaries. So you give the trust advisors 
the authority to change the trustee if they're not happy with the way the trust is being administered. And so that's always, you need to have fail safe things in your documents to prevent that. And that's an example too, that these are long term documents and they could stay intact for many, many years. And as we said, looked at earlier, things change and, and, and uh, situations change. And so you really need to have some safety valves in your documents so that you can prevent that kind of result. I'd also point out again that, you know, that the difference is the will, the, the, the court would have supervised that, make sure they weren't gouging the beneficiaries. When you name a trust, you get all the set of advantages, but you need to be careful about who that trustee is because they, they do have a lot of power. They do have a lot of legal authority. So you got to be careful about who the trustee is. Yes, question here. Person, if you need a person, if you, if you name a person, there's, there's going to be some kind of a time limit. If you name an institution, there is none. Can you put one on legally? Okay, the question was if I name an individual, there's going to be a time limit. Obviously, the, the, the person is not going to uh, live forever. So then the question is okay, then it is, is the backup, the bank, etc. Well, what I usually try to do is, again, give the trustees, if they are family members, the legal authority to appoint a successor trustee. So you put the language in there where you maintain that flexibility and that continuity. And uh, the only situation where I usually name a bank would be an example. We've got one child that uh, is improvident. They're kind of a misfit. and. So sometimes I've seen situations where I've got three or four kids, I've got one child that's a narrative well, and they're a problem. Well, you typically don't want to name a family member the trustee of a trust for a person like that, because you're going to be involved in a lot of anguish and a lot of conflict over the years. So that's a good situation where you would typically might name a bank just so that they can be a little more uh, Thin, thick skin about you know dealing with that ne'er do well air, um, but you you do need to think through how to structure these documents so that you create that that flexibility. The other thing I would say is that really the purpose of the revocable trust, unless you've got specific things we did talk about, for example. We, we maybe give the base of operation to the farming heir and then give put the land into a trust where he can rent it over a long period of time. That kind of trust obviously is going to stay intact for a long time. So that, again, you need to be careful about who you name as trustee and, and how it's going to work. Uh, but most revocable trusts, the idea is that, okay, husband dies, goes to the wife, wife dies, the assets are going to be distributed out of the trust to the children and then the trust ends. I mean, unless there are extenuating circumstances or reasons, that trust should just basically end probably, you know, 9 to 15 months after the death of the second spouse. So that's typically how they work, but again, unless there's extenuating circumstances. Okay. All right. Good question. Yeah, one, one back here, a couple over here. You know, in your will to spell it out. In, in your own words. In and your own words, yeah, in your wishes. Right. Okay. Uh, will the wishes stand up in court over what the well, legality well, is? Yeah, okay, the question is, okay, uh, we talked about in my own will, I want to express how I feel about my estate plan. This is what I did and why I did it. And will it stand up? Well, the point of that's, that's the role of the attorney is to take your wishes and then implement them with legal jargon that will um, honor your wishes. But my point about adding your own personality and your own flair to your will is that I think it's just an expression of who you are and why you did things the way you did them. And there's nothing to stop you from doing that. So, I, you know, obviously you do have to have then the legal language that, that does implement your goals, so. So you gotta have everything crossed just right. Well, time. yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I can, it, in that regard, I'd say this. At this point in time, the legal documents are 
available for all attorneys that do estate planning on a regular basis. I mean, there's, 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 you know, there's resources available. For example, the Iowa Bar Association, they publish every year a, you know, sample documents that have been updated by a big law firm in Chicago called Schiff, Hart, and Waite. They make sure that every word in the document is going to achieve your goals. And so that's the role of the attorney is to take your wishes and then make sure that they use the right language to make sure it's implemented. Can you get those forms off the internet or something? If you become a member of the Iowa Bar Association, <laughs> no, the question was, can I get the forms off the internet? And, and they are, the yeah, the legal part is, is uh, now, the, the, the legal documents are, yeah, they're, they're restricted to members of the Iowa Bar Association because the idea is that they don't want non-lawyers, you know, doing the uh, improper practice of law. However, having said that, one idea I would share with you, and I'm glad you brought that up, there is a website called The Legacy Will, which they talked about, and it is really a, a, a source where you gives you some ideas and some things to express your wishes. And so the legacy will is a way for you to personalize your estate plan and to express your wishes in a way that I think uh, just become a little more formalized, but still it's in your own words. And so, but then even with the legacy will, you still have to have an attorney make sure that your document does on a, in a, from a legal standpoint reflect your wishes. Okay. You do? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And um, again, uh, if, if there are any questions or comments, I'll hang around for a while afterwards. And then plus, as I pointed out, there's my contacts information in your outline. So feel free to shoot me an email, give me a phone call. I'll be happy to respond accordingly. So very good. Thank you. Met on the Carolinian heading south from D.C. Says he've got himself had picked out a seat. She smiled and said, Richmond, when I asked where she was bound, began to wish my life away.